Hello and welcome everyone to Metacell's latest webinar. Today we'll be talking about the state of the art in single unit electrophysiology with some amazing guests we'll introduce in a moment. I uh, am Daniel Knudsen. I'm talking to you from just outside of Boston, Massachusetts uh, in the United States. Uh, I'm a senior consultant here at Metacell. I've been with the company for about uh, two years. Um, and uh, my background is actually in neuroscience and did a lot of uh, single uh, unit electrophysiology doing my PhD, but it's been a bunch of years. So I'm really excited to hear kind of what the current state of the art is uh, from, our, from our great panelists today. So uh, thank you all for taking the time to join us. Uh, it's great to see so many people here uh, online. Um, and thanks also to the speakers. Um, I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves in a minute. Uh, but, but I'll just introduce them by name now. We have uh, Alexis Paez, who is the Director of Science Outreach at NeuroNexus. We have Josh Siegel, who's a Senior Scientist at the Allen Institute. And we have Jeremy Magland, who's a Senior Data Scientist at the Simons Foundation. So a little bit about Metacell. Since uh, 2012, Metacell's applications and services help our partners get the most out of their neuroscience data and models. We combine deep scientific expertise with best practices and bleeding edge technology on the engineering side to understand and unlock the potential of neuroscience data, which as you know, is particularly complex uh, and especially multimodal. We work with a large variety of organizations spanning universities, nonprofits, uh, neurotech uh, and pharma. And just to give a brief overview of some projects which might be of interest to people here, uh, we've worked on a virtual fly brain, which is an interactive tool for uh, exploring detailed neuroanatomy, connectivity, and gene expression patterns in Drosophila. Uh, open Source Brain is an open science uh, repository of computational neuroscience models, built a web application which lets people visualize, simulate, and analyze these models. Um, NetPine faci facilitates development, parallel simulation, and analysis. Of, ne of neural networks using Neuron Simulator, which many of you might be familiar with. Uh, we built a GUI for uh, using NetPine. Uh, and uh, also interesting, probably particularly to this discussion, is uh, NWB Explorer, Neuro Data Without Borders Explorer. It's a web application to visualize and analyze the content of these files. I think uh, many of the panelists will be talking a bit about NWB uh, file formats. So, um, uh, enough about uh, Metacell, let's get into the webinar itself. Um, again, we'll be discussing current state of the art in single unit electrophysiology. I'll be asking some questions uh, of the panelists to kind of spur conversation. Um, uh, but we also encourage you all uh, watching to ask questions. Uh, there's a chat interface there uh, from GoToWebinar. And if you ask questions there, uh, we'll see them. And if, uh, if there's some interesting questions, we'll offer those to the panelists uh, as well. So uh, I already mentioned their names briefly, but I'd like to give the panelists a, a little bit of time to introduce themselves as well. So uh, if you could each give just a little 30 seconds uh, introduction to yourself uh, and what you do with respect to uh, extracellular physiology, that'd be pretty, pretty great. Uh, so let's start with uh, Alexis. Hey everyone, I'm Alexis from NeuroNexus, you can remember that. Um, I am an electrophysiologist. I did. I studied brain and cognitive science with a minor in music at MIT um, and started out in Chris Moore's lab, which I almost overlapped with Josh um, and heard my first neuron from the rat feral cortex then about 12 or 13 years ago. Um, I did my PhD in neurophysiology at McGill and studied the primate vestibular system and I my entire life. So about seven years was I'm not seven years old, but you know what I mean um, was at that time was single unit recordings in um, the macaque brainstem. And now I am, I've been an application scientist at NeuroNexus for the past two and a half years um, and learn about electrophysiologist experiments every day. Great, thanks Alexis. Uh, Josh? Hi everyone, my name is Josh Siegel. I am based in Seattle, Washington. I am currently a senior scientist at the Allen Institute using high density electrophysiology to study the mouse visual system. Uh, before that, I was a grad student at MIT where I did research uh, using tetrodes to study hippocampus in Matt Wilson's lab and feral cortex at Chris Moore's lab. And also while I was in grad school, I co-founded Open EFIS, which is a nonprofit dedicated to the development and distribution of open source tools for electrophysiology. That's great, thanks, Josh. Uh, Jeremy. 
Yes, um, I'm Jeremy Magland. I work at the Center for Computational Mathematics at the Flatiron Institute, which is a division of the Simons Foundation in Manhattan. Uh, for the past several years, we've been developing software for spike sorting, uh, neurophysiology, visual visualization, and method validation. Um, so one of our projects is the Spike Force website, um, where you can compare the accuracy performance of 10 different spike sorters uh, using ground truth recordings. And I'm also involved with the Spike Interface Project and other efforts to make electrophysiology analysis more straightforward uh, for researchers. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much to all the panelists. This is uh, I'm I'm really excited. I think we'll have uh, uh, some great things to talk about with those backgrounds uh, that you all have. Uh, so let's get uh, right into it. Um, First, we're going to, uh, I'm just going to give you kind of uh, a really high level overview uh, of kind of what we're talking about when we talk about single unit uh, uh, extracellular electrophysiology. Um, this will be uh, uh, simple, simplified for many of you, but I just want to put us all on the same page. So we know that the brain has billions and billions of neurons, um, and we know that neurons are kind of a fundamental uh, computational unit uh, of how the brain works, um, and we're interested in figuring out how the brain works. Um, and one method that people have used for a long time is to go in and stick an electrode in the brain and try to record uh, from one or many of these cells uh, at a time to figure out what they're doing with respect to some experimental condition. Uh, but there are lots of neurons um, and few electrodes with respect to neurons. Um, and I often uh, like to compare it to uh, uh, trying to trying to hear the activity of a single neuron to um, dropping a microphone from a helicopter into a huge stadium while a soccer match is going on and, and trying to hear what one, one person is saying to the person sitting next to them uh, when there's a huge crowd all around. Um, and so it's, a, it's, a, it's an analogy I like. Um, and, uh, and so this is the challenge that uh, electrophysiologists are faced with when they're trying to record this data. Um, these figures are from a, a review paper from a few years ago. Uh, that talk kind of about this problem generally and, this, and specifically uh, with respect to spike sorting, which some people have mentioned. So the idea is there's a bit of uh, neuropill here, so some brain tissue and there's individual neurons inside of it, and an electrode where you're trying to record the electrical uh, potential from these neurons. Um, but uh, trying to single out the information from just one neuron is uh, a bit tricky and you often get mixed signals from a whole bunch of them. Um, and so this demonstrates uh, recording, uh, uh, filtering your data, extracting spikes, uh, single unit action potentials, um, and uh, creating a spike train. So that's often the goal of this kind of uh, recording is to end up with spike trains, which is the putative timing uh, of single neurons. Uh, uh, and the idea of spike sorting uh, kind of follows this path. You have some raw data, you filter the data to try to make the spikes uh, stick out a bit. Um, you do some spike detection, you grab little windows around the spikes, you do some feature extraction to try to compare and find which ones look like each other and which ones look different. And finally, you do uh, clustering to get out your spike trains. Uh, I'm sure I've just uh, done a massive oversimplification of lots of the things that, that you all spend lots of time uh, thinking about, uh, but, uh, but there we go. There's a, there's a little background. Um, to get into the questions, um, uh, what I'm interested in and interested for the audience is um, uh, kind of understanding why someone would choose to collect this kind of data uh, versus other kinds of data um, uh, from the brain uh, imaging uh, uh, or other types of electrophysiology where you're not trying to separate out single units, things like uh, LFP or EEG or things like that. So what kind of information does this kind of single unit activity provide us? Um, and how does it compare to other ways of uh, interrogating the brain? Um, and I'll uh, ask uh, Josh to take the first stab at this one. So this is something we are thinking about a lot at the Allen Institute. Um, we actually have two complementary experimental pipelines set up, one for uh, in vivo acute head fixed electrophysiology and one for uh, two photon imaging, where we are trying to make the data collection as similar as possible across the two modalities. So basically we, we've taken um, almost identical rigs and the only thing that's different is the uh, method by which we are collecting the data. And so um, we're starting to look in more detail about the similarities and differences between imaging and electrophysiology. And just kind of at a high level, uh, we know that electrophysiology gives you access to neural activity with much higher temporal resolution. So uh, you can see single action potentials 
uh, very reliably, whereas in imaging, sometimes the, the single action potentials get washed out. Um, and also with electrophysiology, you can record from deeper structures, um, at least in comparison to your standard um, two photon imaging setup, um, which is limited by the depth at which light can penetrate through tissue. Uh, with electrophysiology, we can stick our probes very deep into the brain and record activity from basically any, any structure in the brain. Um, but the, the flip side is that with imaging, um, at least for our acute recordings that we're doing, um, with imaging, you can record to the same, return to the same cells and record their activity reliably over many days, whereas electrophysiology basically have one shot to get the data from the, the cells that you're currently recording. Um, and it's almost impossible to go back and record from the same population of cells. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that we are kind of now looking into some of the more subtle differences between electrophysiology and imaging that people don't often take into account. And um, I think they fundamentally boil down to the fact that with imaging, uh, with calcium imaging in particular, you are measuring the internal state of the cell at any given time, whereas with electrophysiology, you are measuring its outputs when, when it's spiking, when it's mm -hmm. sending information to other parts of the brain. And so I think um, th this helps us understand at a more fundamental level, like the differences in the types of information that we get from those two modalities. That's great. Uh, really interesting uh, to hear kind of the things you're working on specifically to look at uh, uh, the differences and similarities between uh, different modalities. Um, Alexis or Jeremy, do you have anything you want to add to that about uh, considering different modalities or what kinds of data spikes give you versus other things? Maybe Alexis? Um, yeah, I just, um, in terms of the different types of information, it's also, I think, of the different types of artifacts that are introduced when trying to make these measurements, sort of like a, a Schrodinger's cat problem, like the act of trying to measure extracellular activity may, you know, damage intracellular activity around where your probe goes or imaging, um, you know, could contaminate the metal electrodes that you're using to try to do electrophysiology at the same time. And sort of having the complementarity of the two is always better. I would think if you have the capability of getting sort of all the information you can at the same time, which is, I mean, we'll talk later about why you want simultaneous recordings in EFIS itself. The same sort of thing goes for any type of information you can get behavioral, electrophysiological, imaging, et cetera, all at once. Um, I mean, that's great, thank you. Uh, and actually it leads us really nicely into our first uh, poll question. So for the attendees, here's a chance for you all um, to uh, tell us all um, what other data you collect uh, while, uh, here we go, launch poll. So you should see a poll popping up there. What other data do you collect while you're recording spikes? Um, and you can select all that apply. So as uh, Alexis was mentioning, very often people record, um, you know, spike data along with other kinds of data, behavioral data, uh, other electrophysiology signals, imaging, stimulation or uh, optogenetic activation, um, or, you know, if you don't do these things, you can say not applicable. Um, all right, getting lots of good responses. I'll leave it up for just a few more seconds here. And all right, I will give you five more seconds and we'll close the poll. And now you should be seeing, did you get a ah, share results? Here we go. So you should be able to see these here. Lots of people doing behavioral data and other EFIS signals, uh, multi-unit uh, LFP EG, because sometimes you get those for free um, if you're going for single units. Um, also people doing simultaneous imaging or stimulation or optogenetic activation. Thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time to respond there. Um, so uh, thank you, that was really, really great. Um, let's move on to talk a bit more about um, kind of some of the technologies that people use to get their signals from a brain onto a computer where they do some analysis usually and then hopefully into some sort of publication. Um, so we'll talk about uh, state-of-the-art and neural recording 
technologies. So um, what sorts of equipment and tools are necessary for extracellular electrophysiology? Um, what are the major steps in the data path going again from brain to getting kind of spikes on your computer? Um, uh, Alexis? Sure, so I mean, the quick and dirty answer is you need some sort of electrode, if it's one wire, if it's a, a chip with a, hundreds of wires or hundreds of sites somehow to interface with the teeny tiny electrical signals in the brain, um, and then some sort of amplification of those signals, and then some sort of conduit to get from them to the computer, right? So that's the basic answer. So in my daily life now, it's you know a probe, it's connection, those can be passive. They don't have to have electronics built into them. They can just be. Um, but then you would plug into an amplifier. These days, most of them digitize the signal. Um, you don't have you know, those grass instruments, giant boxes with BNC cables anymore that are entirely analog for much longer into the circuit. Um, and then you know, some sort of cable, if it's like USB 3.0 is now the, I don't know if that's the state of the, I hope that's the state of the art at this moment. Um, to your computer and then I guess the computer it's not just a computer you're not just acquiring this data and it sits there there's curation steps there's visualization steps so there's some sort of software platform or code base or to interact with that data that I think is critical in the workflow also to see what to distinguish what you're getting make sure you're getting real data you know you need a process to remove noise or reference out certain artifacts or ground things or um, snip out the relevant signal from the noise and things like that. So there's there's the hardware, but then also the software is an important tool as well. And I'll let these guys. Through. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Jeremy, anything you want to add to that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, for, from my perspective, I usually see the data only after it's gotten to the computer phase. But it's unfortunately there are a lot of uh, difficult. Uh, issues to deal with um, that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be a challenge. Um, for example, file formats, it's kind of a mundane issue, but um, just, you know, double click on a file or something like that and you expect it, well, it, in the ideal world, it would just open and do exactly what you want. But in reality, there's a lot of different file formats to deal, deal with, um, data management, the question of if you have very large files, um, where to save those files. Uh, so a lot of time could be spent uh, uh, dealing with these these kind of issues, how to load the data into a particular visualization. Maybe um, one package would be good for one stage of the processing and another pa package is good for another stage. Um, so we're really trying to make this process easier by integrating tools and making kind of browser-based uh, user interfaces for um, allowing uh, you know, researchers to focus on scientific questions um, but you know we're not there yet, and uh, this is just something that that is part of of the research process. Yep. Well, that's that's the exciting thing. Sometimes uh, challenges or or uh, problems that people have lead to interesting solutions and provide uh, you know opportunity to think about doing it in new ways. I'm really excited uh, for uh, people in a bit to see some of the things that that you've been working on. We have a little um, mini presentation in a bit. So thanks, Jeremy. Um, Josh, uh, Jeremy mentioned some of the, the challenges that happen kind of once the data gets onto the computer for, for users. Uh, what other sorts of challenges are there kind of, I guess, up until that point? I know you, you actively do this 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 uh, work to get um, data from, uh, from a brain onto a computer. What kind of are the current challenges that people are facing there? Yeah, well, I mean, one of the most basic challenges is just being able to connect your electrodes to the amplifiers and digitizers that allow you to then stream the data to a computer. I mean, like if you look at the the state of technology in general, we are currently able to fabricate microchips with as many transistors as there are neurons in the brain. Um, and then we have uh, data pipes that can stream terabytes of data um, to disk in real time, but um, currently haven't figured out a way to uh, connect a very complex uh, set of electrodes embedded in the brain into a, a data stream that can can read all that out at once. So it's basically like, as you scale up the number of electrodes, um, you need wires that are connected to all of those electrodes that um, end up taking up so much space in the brain that you don't have any, any mm. space left for the brain tissue. So I think kind of the, 
um, major advances over the last 10 years of electrophysiology have been shrinking down the, the wires and the, those, the conduits that uh, allow you to read out information from the brain and kind of miniaturizing everything further and further. And so you can pack more electrodes into, into a smaller space. Um, and then another challenge is um, if, if you're doing head fixed electrophysiology, which is what I, I mainly focus on, um, then you are um, not limited by the, the weight of the electrodes. But if you're mm -hmm. doing chronic recordings and you want to do recordings in, in freely moving animals, which is um, gives you really rich data, um, then you need to figure out a way to have everything supported um, on your subject's head, uh, which mm -hmm. requires um, a lot of a lot of tricks to to make things smaller and and lighter and make sure that the the cable that's carrying the data out of the um, the the data from the brain to the computer is not interfering with the the behavior of your subject. So um, there's a lot of challenges there that um, come from trying to get the most naturalistic behavior out of your subject while you're doing electrophysiological recordings. Great, uh, Alexis. Anything you want to add there? I, it's all right on. I was um, prepping a bit with the technology itself, and it's exactly the different. The sort of two different worlds right now where. The probe technology that I'm used to is, like I said, that passive sort of silicon chip with as many sort of any as many electrode sites as you want. We go up, I think, to 256 or 512 at this point, um, and they can all be recorded from because they have their own independent channels. And then you can use a pretty small amplifier on the back end of that that houses everything and sort of everything that can be removed from the animal um, when the animal has to rest or go do something else, or you can you know make things wireless with certain channel counts. Um, and then the other technology, and I know Josh will speak more to it, is this the CMOS world, like NeuroPixels or CMOS, um, complementary metal oxide semiconductors. So they're not built the same way as a silicon probe is built. They can have smaller features. So the probes get smaller and smaller, more and more channel counts. Um, but the difference is that back end. So it's the circuit board is built onto the probe. So you need a special, a different circuit board for every probe design. So Neuronex prides itself on kind of infinite possibilities. If you want to have the electrode site spell out your name, we'll do it. Whereas these other tech, like the CMOS technologies, you get a very, very small probe, very high channel count, but they're more simple, like a few designs to get the high channel count and this big hunk on the back of it. Um, so you have small probe, big connector. Um, mm -hmm. And like Josh said, if you're having a behaving animal, then there's like you have to find some tricks to suspend or to motorize a commutator that'll follow the animal around and things like that. So there's sort of a you can get the best of either world depending on your priority. And that's I mean, that's mm -hmm. the fun thing to talk to people about is what is most important. Is it having the field of vision free? Mm -hmm. Is it having a very, very lightweight implant? Is it having a really high channel count? Is it having mm -hmm. really specific electrode site layouts that match the anatomy of the brain. I mean, all of those are possibilities, and then you get to choose sort of which ones to prioritize and combine into your you know, ultimate experiment. That's great, and it probably differs experiment to experiment, lab to lab, totally. um, for the questions that you're asking. Uh, well, as we start talking about uh, channel counts, that's just come up a lot, like uh, more and more channel counts. I've got another pro uh, poll for you all. So I have another probe for you all, but it's a poll. Um, so I'll, I'll launch this one and uh, we'll ask how many simultaneously recorded electrode sites do you regularly work with? Just to get an idea from the audience. Um, so we're going from one, two to 16, 17 to 100 or 100 plus. Or again, if you're not doing this and you're just interested or maybe you're thinking about starting, you could say not applicable for now. Thank you. We'll leave this for a minute. And then uh, just to, to introduce it in uh, a moment, uh, we'll have, uh, we're going to have a couple of mini presentations uh, throughout the course of this. So um, we're going to start with Alexis and she can tell us a bit uh, more about maybe some of the stuff she was just talking about uh, that come, coming from Neuronexus. So I will wait for the poll. Wow, we got really good responses here. Um, and share the responses. So how many electrode sites do you regularly work with? 7% at one. Uh, a nice little, the nice little uh, bell curve there. One, two to 16, 17 to 100, and 100 plus, um, reflecting the distribution maybe of those different uh, uh, experiment types. So that's really great. Um, thank you. Uh, and now uh, I'm going to turn over the speaking to Alexis. Um, she's going to give you 
uh, a couple minutes um, on her topic. So Alexis, take it away. Thanks. So I just wanted to, I guess, use this time to describe what Neuronexus offers to the field now. Um, we have a large array of products. I gave a webinar earlier on our 200 page catalog. So it starts with acute probes. These have a really big circuit board on the back. Um, they're easier to handle, they're lower cost, but again, you wouldn't implant them. This is an implantable probe that we would sell the insertion tool to you know, deliver it to the brain and then remove it. So it's very small, lightweight, or you can implant um, a micro drive. This is on a rat and a mouse, just to show how small these light and lightweight these things can be. Um, to allow you to move the probe. We also make three-dimensional arrays to go on small animals. So those are 64 and 128 channel matrix arrays. We make um, surface arrays. So these are EEG um, grids for rodents. We also make ECOG grids that are often used in primates. For penetrating probes for primates, these are the vector arrays. So these will let you go, like I would use them to get to the macaque brainstem. That's how long those are. Again, the three-dimensional arrays. So these are high density connector matrix arrays. The one that's most in focus is 256 channels. Um, and then our 256 or 128 channel smart probes would interface directly. So they have their digitization attached to their board, um, but not on the probe itself. Those would interface with our Smartbox Pro system. So we can go to the next slide. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, Neuronexus does offer this complete solution. As we said, all the tools, or at least the, the half, the tools that I spoke of. So going from an electrode through cabling, digitization through the cabling to your box, whatever it may be to the computer. Um, this is Neuronexus's answer to that. So we have the Smartbox Pro, which is built to record 1,024 channels. It is that box and a few wires. It's very portable. You can move it around with your animal. We're not, I mean, it's not going to be attached to your animal, but um, 30 kilohertz sampling. It does connect with that USB 3.0 that I had mentioned. So it's, it's fast um, to enable that sampling. And then the important feature is, like I said, Neuronexus allows very customizable and a huge variety of electrode site layouts. And then that probe centric information. So your, your map, your layout is brought through um, your software and your data as well. So you can see on the, I don't, you can't see my mouse, so I won't gesture anymore, but um, you can sort. So for example, in the screenshot, I had sorted my probe electrode sites as a 64 channel probe eight by eight, um, sort it by you know the depth. So each color band is the sites at a given depth. Um, and then on the right side is a heat map. So I forgot, can't read small enough um, to see. I forget which parameter I was following, but it'll show you in real time, say a signal to noise or an absolute am amplitude, or even we can now, since this version, currently there's a spike detection version um, that you could have a sort of firing rate measurement within the anatomy of your, like the geometry of your probe. So, hey, there's activity on this corner and not on that corner. Um, and then the data that you acquire, we do save in the NWB compatible file format. Um, and just so everyone's more confident, there are over 950 institutions around the world that have used Neuronexus probes. And I like to say we're cited in nearly 300 nature papers so far. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Alexis. It's great. Good, good uh, overview of some of the technologies that are out there to use in these experiments. Um, uh, just uh, a reminder to people, uh, there's the chat interface there. So if you want to, um, uh, ask a question uh, or make a comment or something like that, uh, uh, feel free to use the chat interface to ask us questions. Um, okay, so uh, so my next question, we're talking again about uh, channel counts and, and lots of numbers of simultaneously recorded units. So why why are these channel counts increasing? You know, Josh talked a little bit about some of the problems with increasing channel counts. At some point you get so high in channel counts that there's no room for the brain tissue itself anymore, replacing it all with electrodes. Uh, clearly, there's got to be you know, a point of, maybe, maybe not clearly, a point of diminishing returns. Um, but I guess maybe, Jeremy, in your, in your opinion, what do we get with more channels when we're moving to, to more, more channels recorded at the same time? Oh, Jeremy might still be <laughs> muted there. The, Sorry. Thank you. From the statistical perspective, um, if you're looking for units of a certain type, um, you would get more of them in one experiment. So you'd increase the statistical power. Um, but I'm also um, would assume that you you would probably want to cover more uh, a larger volume of the brain um, in one go, so you can see simultaneously what's happening in different areas. Um, the density of of the electrodes is an interesting question. Um, at some point, making it more and more dense uh, doesn't buy you anything in terms of being able to detect and separate um, different neurons, but 
um, to some extent, there is a, there is a benefit to um, increasing the density as well. Great. Um, and uh, of course, uh, more channel counts means more uh, data to process. So actually, someone, uh, one of the, um, uh, someone in the audience actually has asked, can we know about some of the data sampling rate challenges uh, that people face? So is there someone who, who wants to talk about uh, sampling rate challenges um, uh, and, and, the, and the, yeah, the challenges there? I can take a baby step and then they can okay. finish That'd the race great. for me. So I'm one that, um, I don't need to tell that story, never mind. Um, <laughs> I think that the higher sampling rate allows more information about a given waveform, right? So if you're going to distinguish two units waveforms, like I, I so I can tell this story that I had um, for a paper to show that I really had recorded two units at a time. I mean, 10 years ago, that was a big deal, especially in a primate brainstem, you just don't do it. Um, now you do, you're welcome. Um, I had to show the waveforms of two different units and some people said, how do you know they're different? How do you know they're different? Um, and it was like, okay, I can check a firing rate or I can check, you know, a sensitivity to something or whatever, you know, some farther along analysis of that neuron's behavior so that it was distinct from the one, you know, hundred microns away from it, supposedly hundred microns away from it. Um, so the, the more resolution you have of any given waveform, the more data points you have to distinguish one from another. Um, but then the trick is that once you, you know, locate that waveform, you can give it a single timestamp. And then you end up with this binary just vector of timestamps. And that's what, that, at least for me, that's what I did with everything else I did about that neuron was timestamps of spike trains. And you can test synchroniz synchronization of those spikes between neurons um, and that matters. So yes, the spike sorting is very important. So I would say like more and more data points to sort the spikes, but then once you've got them, and so these guys can, I don't have no idea how you handle all of that data to spike sort. It just magically happens. But then once you've <laughs> done that, it's a lot easier. You can shrink everything down to like a one kilohertz, maybe faster than that um, sampled data set and do a lot with it after that. So you can maybe uh, not have the representation be as uh, dense and maybe save some save some space uh, at, the, at the very least. Um, thank you. That's uh, probably very naive. So that's one side of the field, right? That spike mm -hmm. timing matters. Um, spike timing absolutely matters. The, si the shape of the spike waveform. So anybody that does like patch clamp is probably yelling at me through the chat box right now. Like, of course, <laughs> the waveform shape is going to matter forever. So you can see if it whatever, if it flips, if it gets broader, if it doesn't, I mean, if you're in the cerebellum and you have a complex spike, that's very different from a simple spike, et cetera. So, I mean, that was a very simplistic representation of just, yeah, down sample, you'll be fine. That's not always true either. Got it. Thank you. Um, well, uh, we are going to move on and have a little uh, short presentation next from uh, Josh. So uh, Josh, uh, again, I'll share the slides. So just let me know when you want to uh, advance uh, and you can take it away. Yeah, so uh, at the Allen Institute, uh, our electrophysiology program primarily utilizes neuropixels probes, which are these uh, new CMOS-based electrodes, um, which uh, uh, Alexis mentioned earlier. Um, up in the upper left, you can see a representation of the, the probe. Um, the shank itself, so the, the, the tiny thin portion that has the electrodes printed onto it, um, is 10 millimeters long, um, which is actually longer than we need to, to cover the full depth of the, the mouse brain. Uh, but it's, it's really nice that it's that long because it allows you to fit multiple probes into the brain at once. Um, so these, these probes were developed by a consortium of funding agencies uh, including the Allen Institute, uh, Wellcome Trust, uh, Gatsby, and uh, HHMI, and um, were done in close collaboration with IMEC, which is a, a Belgian nanoelectronics research center. Um, and so um, basically the, the scientists at the Allen Institute and, and other places helped um, kind of refine the specifications for these probes and test them out in vivo. And um, it turns out that they they worked better than almost anyone had imagined, um, just because the the high site density and uh, long uh, coverage. So basically, you get um, 384 recording sites 
um, across about 3.8 millimeters of, of brain tissue, which allows you to do things like record simultaneously from the cortex, hippocampus, and thalamus with one penetration. Um, and now in our experiments uh, down in the lower left, uh, you can see a representation of um, how we're inserting six probes into the brain at once. Um, and so our, our goal here was to really densely sample the mouse visual system. So we're recording from uh, six mouse cortical visual areas as well as uh, visual areas in the thalamus. And on the right, you can see a spike raster of, of simultaneously recorded cells uh, from all of these areas and also from, from hippocampus and, and midbrain structures. Um, and um, yeah, I think the, the rasters like these kind of speak for themselves because you're, you're getting um, not only many individual re recordings from individual cells, uh, which reduces the number of experiments that you need in order to collect the same amount of data, uh, but you also get to look at the rich interactions between all of these different, uh, all of these different brain areas, which is really the, the scientific question that I'm most interested in. So uh, you can go to the next slide. So um, yeah, one thing that's been hinted at is that when you're collecting all of this, uh, the, these data sets um, with lots of electrodes, the data processing becomes a real challenge. Um, uh, fortunately, we have a lot of really great open source tools to help with the, this data processing. So uh, this slide gives kind of an, uh, an overview of uh, the data processing that the Allen Insti Institute is doing um, using some tools that have been developed in house and others that uh, we've um, we've taken from other uh, open source projects. So uh, kind of the, the data collection all happens with the Open EFIS GUI which is open source software for uh, multi-channel electrophysiology data acquisition um, that streams the data to disk. And then um, we take that uh, data set, which we, we like to represent as like a, an image of channels by time up in the upper right. Um, as it kind of like um, highlights the, um, the fact that the, these neural pixels are almost taking an electrophysiological image of the, of the tissue. Um, and then when you look at how the, those voltages change over time, uh, you can kind of see these these spikes localized in time and space, so the, the little dark spots in um, in that picture. And then we use uh, spike sorting software developed by Marius Pachitariu at Genelia called Kilosort 2 um, to uh, extract the, the spike times and assign them to particular cells in our recording. Um, and that's that's also uh, open source. And then uh, we use a package developed at the Allen Institute called EC for spike sorting that it, um, will kind of calculate quality control metrics for all of the units. Um, this is something that we think is really important. Um, kind of this idea of the ideal single unit is um, fairly subjective, and I think any any unit that we record extracellularly has the chance to be contaminated or incomplete in ways that are are sometimes difficult to quantify. Um, but I think the, we have to do the best that we can in order to um, to estimate the the quality of each of the units that we're recording, and then take that into account when we're doing downstream analysis. Because there's some analyses where um, you really just want all the spikes that you can get, and you don't care if they're from well isolated single units. Whereas there are other analyses that uh, it's it's really crucial to um, be sure that you're recording from only one cell at a time. Um, and then finally, we package all the data into NWB format, um, which we then share with the world through um, the Allen SDK, uh, which is a, a Py open source Python library for um, interacting with the the data that we've collected. And so so far, we've released data from almost 100,000 cells. Um, through brainmap.org, um, all packaged into NWB format. That's great. Thanks, Josh. And uh, uh, I'll just say we're getting lots of questions now, so thanks for, for hearing me ask for questions from the audience. And uh, in fact, a lot of them were asking, but but how do we analyze the data? What are the, what are the pipelines like? So we're not going to have a chance to get to every question, uh, but Josh started answering them. It's like he knew what people were going to want to know next. Um, so we talked a little bit about the pipelines there and the analysis, but um, we're, we're going to shift now into uh, uh, kind of the state of the art and sorting algorithm, software tools analysis, this idea of, okay, we got the spikes, onto the computer. Uh, okay, it took us 40 minutes. We got some spikes onto a computer. Uh, obviously, it takes a lot longer than reality. But now, let's talk about what, what you do with this, this uh, 
at least in Josh's case, this flood of data, 100,000 individual neurons. I mean, um, you you need some probably pretty sophisticated uh, processing pipelines and things like that. Um, and uh, I imagine the resources that a big uh, um, institution like Allen Institute can can put towards something like this might be different than a small lab with uh, just a few researchers and different levels of grants. So. Um, what are, uh, I guess, some of the, the challenges that people are facing kind of across the board um, in terms of getting uh, their, uh, th their data like analyzed so they can look at it uh, um, uh, once it gets on the computer? Um, and this uh, one I'll, I'll ask to Jeremy to, to start out here. Uh, sure, so, so one, one um, issue that's, that's very related to that is the question of how automated um, the that that's sort of one decision you have to make it in a lab is like how automated do you want to make the uh, your processing and you know the obvious advantage there's many advantages of, of automating one of them is um, it takes less human time um, and uh, things are more reproducible um, and uh, there's less potential for bias uh, in, in that processing but on the other hand um, depending on the application um, things might not be at a point where where everything that you want to do is automated. It, a, a lot of labs have very kind of specific custom things that they want to do. So um, there is a balance. And if uh, in terms of the manual uh, curation and processing of the data. Thanks. Um, uh, oh. That uh, you really need good quality visualization tools. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, I think we had a, a pause there. I didn't mean to talk over you. Um, so I think you said, uh, 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 in terms of that, you need good quality visualization tools, maybe so that you know what you're looking at and um, and so that uh, maybe I'm taking a stab here, that you can trust the automated parts of your pipeline. Um, I know that uh, could be an important thing. You know, um, scientists, especially if they're gonna vouch for um, the results they're gonna put in their papers, they wanna know kind of what happened uh, and if they're doing it manually, they can at least say, I trust the work I did and I can represent this to others. Uh, but thinking about letting um, an algorithm or something take over parts of that pipeline, um, do you see that being uh, a problem that people, uh, that people contend with uh, in terms of like how much to allow to be automated? Uh, Jeremy, just as a follow up. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, there is a danger with the automation that you would just take whatever comes out of the system and maybe somebody has a paper on a method and then you kind of justify using it because of, of some results in that paper, and then you just publish whatever comes out. And that's that's definitely a mistake. So you want to accompany any kind of analysis that you do with proper visualization and and, and other techniques to really get a feel for whether what's coming out of the of the system is 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 feasible. So it's an ongoing thing, and I think you know the ideally the automation will catch up with whatever people decide that is the best practice in the lab. Um, using other mechanisms. Thanks. Um, uh, Alexis, what do you see as some of these the the challenges that people face uh, once their data is on their computer? Um, uh, is, do you see the same sorts of things as Jeremy in terms of manual versus automated? Uh, is there are, are there other things that that you think about or that you experience yourself? Um, so I think I live in a time capsule because when I did this, I was the first one in my lab to do simultaneous recordings at all. So even like eight channels, I could kind of manually go through. I mean, I started with a DAT tape and would play back one channel through an oscilloscope and trigger it on the slope and said, that's an extra potential, that's not. Um, and then, you know, as it becomes more and more important to notice that, hey, there's superposition of action potentials. It's not just one neuron that's talking here. Because where I was recording, we had firing rates of, you know, 60 hertz or something not like a few spikes per second, it was a lot of spikes. And so they were gonna just jump on top of each other. And so, I mean, the, the most primitive sorting is, okay, that looks like a spike. Anything within a couple milliseconds after it can't be a spike. I mean, that was like the first algorithm that I used was, okay, there's a refractory period. So that is the answer. Um, and then exactly the automation. So I, I wanted an autom automatic thing and I convinced myself that whichever automated algorithm took the longest had to be the best <laughs> I mean this again this is like five ten years ago um closer to ten years ago um and it was exactly the same thing too it had a name other people had published with it I could publish with it too um which didn't make it correct it just made it sort of 
accepted somehow, like if everybody made the same mistake and we all knew the mistake that we had made, someday someone with a better algorithm could go back and fix it. I, I don't really know that part. Um, but now I'm finding that perhaps the algorithm that's got a memory to it would be the one, like that's the next feature I would want to add in. So yeah, refractory period is a short little memory thing, a longer memory. So um, like to speak back to the Lego software that goes with the Smartbox Pro from NeuroNexus, we have this, what we're calling, you know, a rough cut real time spike sorting module, um, but it's kind of literally real time based on a few principal components. You see a spike, you see a different spike. It's these two units, but it's not saying now that we know what these spikes seem to be doing, let's go back a few minutes and refine those. So I know that like Jeremy has algorithms that are way smarter and would take all that in. And that's why like Josh's slide said, this runs overnight. That's what I zeroed mm -hmm. in on is, this is my algorithm, click it, go take a nap or go record more or whatever it may be. Um, there's so there's always more to consider. And the nice thing is that with, with NWB, with hundreds of thousands of cells being in this larger data bank, we start learning how these cells really do interact. And that's the other thing with higher channel counts and you know more probes and whatever else is that spike sorting may not just be you know what tetras used to be, four wires in a brain was way better than one. And you could mm -hmm. kind of you know triangulate based on those four wires. Now we're triangulating based on almost the whole brain in some cases. And I don't know, eventually it just turns into you're modeling the whole brain to tell what one spike it did or didn't do. <laughs> and I'm probably like, fairy tale right now but no i mean uh they they those are real problems that people are facing right like uh and uh and actually i think it's a really nice uh transition into jeremy's mini presentation um <laughs> along with some of the other questions we're getting from the audience here's here's a verbatim do you have any public repo for algorithms that we can check them out so i think this might be something um where i'll, I'll hand it over to jeremy and he can talk about at least a couple of such uh public repos um so jeremy go ahead and take it away here no, thank you. So uh, two slides. One, of, The first one is about kind of validation re and reporting of the comparison between algorithms. And the second will be more involved with what tools that we are providing to, uh, uh, to labs. So um, we have a website. You can either go to the website or look at our recent eLife article that compares the accuracy of 10 different spike sorting algorithms that um, uh, compared based on ground truth data sets. Um, now, I should say that um, we're not trying to say, draw a conclusion on which spike sorter is best overall, necessarily. Um, we basically showing that in different situations, uh, right now, different spike sorters might uh, perform better. And um, it's important that, so a lot of these are simulations um, using different kind of simulation technologies, and others are paired recordings. Um, paired recordings obviously have a, an advantage in that it's real data. Um, but we don't yet have enough to kind of represent the kind of diversity of what people have. So we're kind of expanding that database over time and also trying to get more realistic um, simulations. Um, but uh, yeah, there's more details in, in the article. Um, one thing I should point out is that we, part of the work here was to wrap all 10 spike sorters in uh, Docker containers. So because each one has different operating system requirements and um, in order to run them all in the same kind of environment, um, we basically wrap, wrap the entire operating system up for each each sorter, and we were making that available also, so um, that labs could use the same kind of interface to 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 run the different spike sorters. Um, so maybe advance to the next slide. Mm -hmm. oh, let's see. Oh, apologies. I don't um, think that's so. Uh, that relates here. to this. Okay. Yeah, and maybe you just click through because I have some some other things that appear there. Um, oh, I see. But yeah, the Spike Interface Project um, I, oh, there is we go. something right. that I'm involved with. It, it's it's largely maintained by um, um, some other folks here that that are listed. But um, this this really sort of tries to solve the problem of a disconnect between different file formats and different tools. So although the file format problem might be solved in one lab and another lab, question of sharing tools and sharing data, um, that's still not solved. So Spike Interface tries to kind of um, simplify that process and uh, decouple the kind of visualization tools and the analysis tools from 
the spike sorters so that you can run any spike sorter from any package and then visualize, visualize it or analyze it with any other tool. So there shouldn't be like a, um, you know, all or nothing one way or the other. And um, so this other project that we're working on called Labbox Ethos is meant to um, kind of be a browser-based solution for sharing data sets, um, operating within kind of the web browser environment in a way that's agnostic to the underlying spike sorting method, the file formats, and um, we're hoping to incorporate a lot of different visualizations uh, into this tool. That's that's really exciting. So, how would uh, uh, a user kind of uh, like a like an end user, someone who's got some some spikes, how would they actually interface with this to 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 use this lab box ethos? Is it something they install well, on their local machine, or how does I, that work? I should take a step back and, and direct people right now to Spike Interface because hmm. that's the that's the project that's that's kind of at a uh, at ha has had a release already. So uh, Labbox Ethos, I'm just saying in the future, keep an eye on that. Ah, got it. Um, but yeah, if you have Python programming, some Python experience um, that comes in handy, or otherwise, definitely learn that and then go to the Spike Interface website and they have examples, and you can start to um, interact with your data in that way. That's really yeah. exciting. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Um, and uh, I mean, these are these are some great tools. Um, uh, we you, you talked a bit about uh, being able to, I guess, uh, I don't know if this is the right word, but abstract maybe across the different spike sorters so that, that it was easier to use some of them. Um, we also talked about uh, before kind of some of the challenges in just terms of data size and things like that. And you said that this tool is uh, helpful for helping people share data and things. So. Uh, uh, what other issues besides like there's format it's just I'm, I'm just hearing lots of like issues right there's lots of lots of data the format issues they're sharing them between each other there's different kinds of uh spike sorting algorithms so i wonder um uh josh you especially at the allen institute you're saying you have a hundred thousand cells um how do you deal just i guess with the sheer size of the data um do you have special tools there or are you using uh, open source tools like these um, how, how, do, how do you think about like the size of the data and moving it from place to place or, or do you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we don't have any uh, magical solutions for dealing with large volumes of data. Um, we try to keep it backed up in a, a number of locations, but, but that obviously ends up taking up lots of hard drive space. So we, we put, a, put a lot of money into um, on-premise storage. Um, and once we release the data, we uh, put the raw data onto AWS. So um, if you're interested in taking a look at the, the raw data um, that went into our data release, um, it's all available in a, a public Amazon S3 bucket. Um, but I'll, I'll also say, um, like once you've done the spike sorting step, uh, the data gets compressed substantially. Um, mm. So um, all the recordings from those 100,000 cells can can easily fit on my workstation hard drive, um, and I can analyze those whenever I want. So, um, kind of once once you've gone through the spike sorting step, the the data gets compressed enough that it's it's more reasonable to work with. So uh, that that leads to another question. You know, maybe if what you're moving around are these uh, this already pre-processed data a little bit, um, now you have. Um, the potential for for that to be wrong. So, what if something was wrong in in your sorting or not quite right? Um, how might that uh, affect analysis results? Um, and kind of what are some of the solutions to getting around that? Because if you want to share data um, and it's already in this pre-processed form, but it happens to be wrong, um, you know, what what kinds of what kinds of uh, of things come out of that, and how are people trying to fix that? Uh, Jeremy, do you have have opinions on that? Um, yes, uh, yeah, that's kind of the dilemma, and this is why the, the size of the data is kind of coupled with um, with this uh, with this question of accurate spike sorting, for example. Um, because yeah, you you would like to have accurate spike sorting from the beginning, and then you only have to share the results of that. But if you're kind of in the realm of trying to improve that that methodology, or if you are you need to go back to the raw data for some reason, like you already have the spike sorting, but you you want to go back and uh, somehow uh, get those clips or or do some other kind of analysis, then you're sort of stuck. Um, I I should say that sometimes it's just infeasible to transfer data from one lab mm -hmm. to another because it's too large. So for that reason, I'm very interested in kind of 
techniques that allow data to stay in the lab where it was collected um, and then but still access it in in terms of what one possibility is to send processing routines to the lab and there would be mm -hmm. like some kind of open resource that, that they make available that allows you to run um, containerized so that it's kind of safe from a security standpoint but containerized processing on on that data but it's but it still stays in the same place hmm. or um, other ways through apis um, as the allen uh, institute has done with with um, with the downstream data um, to um, extract at least pieces of pieces of the data it's hmm. really interesting um, and uh, uh, can we find out more about that on on the websites that you shared before Imagine. Sure. Yeah. If you go to our lab box ethos, even though it's under development, that's the, these are the type of things we're trying to do is decouple where the analysis happens um, and the containerization and everything um, from the other aspects of of, uh, of the processing. That is that's really exciting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we're getting really close to the end here. So I'm going to put us into our last phase here. What's next? We talked a lot about, I guess, what's next. Uh, so maybe we already started to answer this. Um, but I have one final poll for the audience. And while um, they answer this question, I'll ask the panelists to start thinking about their answers to this question, which is uh, a really quick one-liner from each of you, which is like, what new technologies or directions are you most excited about in the field? Um, and what do you want other people to know about? Again. You've already shared some of those things, uh, um, but maybe like one thing for people to focus on, uh, a couple words to say like, uh, you really need to care about this thing or, or watch in this space, this is where interesting things will be happening. So uh, I'll ask the audience uh, this poll next, what new technologies and directions excite you the most? Um, these are very broad categories. I could only, we could only put five in there, um, but let us know um, what is interesting to you uh, among these five. And then we'll get the last word from the panelists. All right. Getting some answers coming in. Audience, you're old hat at this now. You figured out how this poll thing works. Thank you. All right. Just a couple more seconds there. And all right. And here are the results. People are excited uh, in a lot of things, but let's see, uh, automated sorting algorithms and tools, that's that's great, we talked a bunch about those. Uh, new hardware, probes, drives, acquisition systems, we got, we got to talk about some of that too, and simplified turnkey advanced analysis, I think we started to touch on that, but that's obviously a very exciting uh, uh, avenue as well. Um, then we also have multimodal recording, so spikes plus other data types, um, and easier data management or sharing. So thank you again for all of that. And now, lightning round, uh, what are each of the three of you most excited about? Uh, and we'll start with Josh. Uh, so very hard to just pick one thing. I think in the next five years, there's gonna be uh, huge advances in all the, the different areas that were in the poll. Um, but one thing that's uh, on the, the very near horizon, which I'm super excited about, is uh, Open Neural Interface from John Newman and Jack Zhang at MIT. Uh, this is part of the next generation open EFIS acquisition system and really will facilitate uh, really simple low latency closed loop feedback, um, which will open up a huge number of possibilities for really interacting with the brain in, in really detailed ways. Great, thank you. Uh, Alexis. My short answer is state of the art EFIS for the masses. So when I heard like, you know, implementing these sorting algorithms as data storage, I don't know a lot of Python. Um, so I'm looking forward to the system. So like Neuronex is working on one. I know I'm sure like Josh's the open EFIS to open neural interface is similar um, to have a plug and play from, you know, probe, wire, box, click a button, and you can get some pretty good analysis out. And then of course, manually curate it later, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alexis. And uh, Jeremy, what are you most uh, excited about? Well, I'm really excited for the day uh, when scientists and uh, will not have to worry so much about shuffling files around and they can ask questions, uh, spend all their time asking scientific questions and exploring the results. Okay. Great. Thank you all. There's a lot of exciting stuff uh, to keep looking at in this field. Um, these are three people you should be paying attention to. There's lots more out there. Um, and 
we are really happy. I want to thank each of you, Alexis, Jeremy, and Josh, for being here with us today. Thank all of the uh, attendees for your attention um, and uh, let you know we'll be having more uh, interesting webinars in the following months, so keep an eye out. And if you are interested about any things you heard about today, you can contact us either via Twitter at Metacell or email us at info at Metacell.us. Uh, and with that, I will thank everyone again and say have a great rest of your day. Stay, stay safe out there and we'll see you next time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dan.